Hello, everybody, and welcome to the EGU webinar, Meet the EGU Editors. Today, we have three speakers from three different EGU journals to talk to you about the publication process from submission to acceptance um, and cover topics such as um, how to get into editing if you're interested in this role, the importance of peer review, and also some of the different topics that the EGU journals cover. So we have three speakers today, and um, we will introduce them in just a second. If you have a question or you would like to start a discussion of any kind, please feel free to use the chat and the Q&A box. The Q&A box will be monitored more closely for questions. So if you really want to put a question to the speakers, please put your question there. Um, but otherwise, the chat will also be moderated. So firstly, I would like to introduce um, Julianne Damberg, who is an editor for the Solid Earth Journal of EGU. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. So yeah. Um... So first, I wanted to give an overview about myself. So I'm an assistant professor at the University of Florida. So I've been there since 2019. And I did my PhD in Germany at GFZ Potsdam. And then I did different postdocs in the US at Texas A&M and Colorado State. And for a while, I was also a project scientist at UC Davis. And so my expertise is that I am a geodynamicist. And so my, my research focuses on different uh, processes that affect mantle convection, and in particular, mantle plumes and mantle heterogeneity. So for example, I'm interested in phase transitions, melting in the mantle, magma dynamics, and the evolution of the mineral grain size. And I'm also one of the principal developers of an open source geodynamic modeling software that's called Aspect. So I'm sort of both in geodynamics and also a bit into applied math. And in terms of like being an editor, I am an editor for like a topical editor for Solid Earth. And I've like, um, like I started doing that a bit more than a year ago. So it's basically, I just started out of that. And there are many things that I'm also still learning about like what it means to be an editor and what I have to do. And for Solid Earth, the idea is that with the editors, it has a few executive editors, but then it has many topical editors and they are each like a specialist on a given topic. So that means after you submit your paper to Solid Earth, then the, ex the executive editor would decide like which topical editor would be the right person to handle this paper. And that's based on a number of keywords that you would submit with the paper. And so since my expertise is geodynamics, I usually handle uh, geodynamics papers. And yeah, you can also have a look at the Solid Earth website where all of the topical editors are listed. So, uh, next, I wanted to say a bit about the journal Solid Earth. Um, so in, in general, uh, as it says, it's about Solid Earth. So like it, co it covers multidisciplinary research on the composition, structure, and dynamics of the Earth from the surface to the deep interior and at all spatial and temporal scales. And it has four specific subject areas that are core and mantle structure and dynamics, crustal structure and composition, tectonic plate interactions, magma genesis, and lithosphere deformation at all scales, and the evolving Earth surface. And so what that means is pretty much if your work, like if your research is on anything that has to do with the solid Earth, you can submit a paper to solid Earth. And even if you work on the outer core, even if it's not solid, that still is also fine. Um, and then it, like the study can be on observations or experiments or also a theoretical study and like especially methods papers are also welcome too. So there's a separate category for methods papers. And one question was also like, is it more shorter papers or longer papers? And like there are different categories. There are also like shorter commentaries. Um, you can also make your paper as long as you want, but there are page charges. So if you make your paper really, really long, then you have to pay more for it. Um, and in terms of disciplines, it covers a lot of different disciplines. So it's basically from geochemistry, geodynamics, to geodesy, gravity, geoelectrics, geomagnetism, seismology, rock physics, so basically uh, uh, all different disciplines you can think of that have to do with the solid earth. Um, and one thing that I wanted to go a bit more into is the review process, because that's a bit different from many of the other journals. And the idea is that the review process is open and interactive. Um, I can maybe also, so there's like a specific, uh, there's a link on the Solid Earth website where basically that just covers like how does the research process work, uh, the review process work. Um, I will just like paste that into the chat. Um, it even has a picture. And the idea is basically that, so once you submit your paper, 
um, I mean, the executive editor like picks a topical editor and then the topical editor can say, oh, does it fit within the scope of the journal? And does it look like it's uh, like it has good scientific quality so that it can be sent out to peer review? And so once I, as a topical editor, would say, yes, that's fine, um, then it will be posted like openly in solid earth discussions. So like everyone could then see, oh, this paper that you submitted, um, that's like under review in solid earth. And it's, it's the preprint is basically already online. And then there starts this open discussion for six weeks where basically you will get comments. So I will like, I will ask reviewers to review the paper and they will post their referee comments. But then also everyone in the community can post comments and like ask questions and like make comments on what they think about the paper. And the idea is really that this is like an open discussion where it's like a back and forth between the authors and the community. And so as an editor, I would also comment in, in this phase. So if I think one comment was specifically important, um, I would say that. And then after this open discussion, the, so you as an author would have four weeks to write a final response to all of the comments that are there. And um, then four to eight weeks after the end of this discussion, you would have to submit the revised version of the manuscript. And then afterwards, it pretty, mu pretty much works like with every other journal. So uh, you basically would like, so unless, so like at that stage as an editor, I could already say like, if, if I think in the final response, that's like not good enough, the paper could already be rejected. But otherwise you would like then submit a revised version of the manuscript and then either it would go to another round of peer review or it would just be accepted or basically a decision would be made on the paper. And so what that also means is throughout the whole review process, your paper is already public, but then at the end also all of the reviewer comments and your replies, they are all public. So basically at the end, everyone could go back and see like what did the reviewers think about this and like how did you address their comments. Then, um, yeah, so that was, uh, that was what I wanted to say about Solid Earth. And then there were a few, like uh, one, one other point we wanted to discuss was like tips that editors can give you about like your, like for like best practices, what can you do when you submit your paper? Um, one question was like, is the is a cover letter necessary? So I, I just think it's always useful to have a cover letter, but it's not like this is like nature or science where we reject lots of papers before even sending them out to peer review. But I think it's useful for the executive editor to decide like what's the what is this like what's the topic, uh, which topical editor should they assign? Um, one thing I also wanted to mention: so whenever you submit a paper to Solid Earth. Um, there is an automatic similarity check where basically it checks against like all of the texts online if any phrases are similar to anything that has been published before. So it checks even against your own previously published papers. And so that means it's good practice that even if you have methods that are really similar to a previous paper to rephrase that because um, otherwise this will show up to me as an editor as like an alert, oh, this is like the, the plagiarism check, uh, something is wrong. Um, yeah, so then the, the last two questions were like how to respond to criticism. And there I would say it's just most important to take it seriously. So the basically the only like the I would only reject the paper if I see oh the like there was a reviewer who had a comment and then the authors didn't take that seriously. And you can agree or disagree with what the reviewer said. But as long as I see the authors have seriously considered what the reviewers have said, then that's totally fine. Um, and so since I mostly handle papers that are within my expertise, I know most of the reviewers. And so I know I trust them that they have the expertise to judge this paper. And so when I see someone doesn't take that seriously, then I, I think that that's, that's not good practice. And like so far, I only had to reject one paper. So I don't have that much experience with like what's, what's not good to do. And then the last thing was like, should early career scientists also review papers? And I think, uh, yes, absolutely. And we always strive to have diversity within our pools of reviewers. So um, there have to be at least two. So I always try to assign like one early career scientist and one more senior scientist or like people from like from Europe and the US and from different communities and different backgrounds. And I think because everything is public in the end, that's also a useful opportunity to learn about like how to do a good review and how other people review. And so the only problem for early career scientists, if like if neither the authors nor me know your name, then it's hard to assign you as a reviewer. 
So that that's pretty much the only the the only thing that like if I know someone and I know they're an expert as an early career scientist, I would also assign them as a reviewer. All right, so that was everything I wanted to say. Thank you so much. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Georgina King, who is an editor for the Geochronology Journal, which is one of the newer AGU journals. Thanks very much. Uh, so hi, everyone. Um, as has already been said, I'm an editor for Geochronology. Just before I talk about the journal, I'll just give you a brief overview of my career to date. Um, so I'm presently an assistant professor at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. Um, but before that, I started life as a geographer, actually, um, at the University of Oxford before doing a PhD in Earth Sciences at, at St Andrews in Scotland. So I changed to kind of harder science um, progressively. But even during my um, bachelor degree, I started to work on the luminescence dating method, which is my particular field of expertise. So I'm really interested in, um, in developing this technique and applying it to novel geomorphological um, questions. So trying to answer unresolved debates by, by modifying the method. Um, after my PhD, I held postdoc positions uh, at Aberystwyth in Wales um, before moving to Switzerland uh, to the University of Lausanne. I then held a job as the head of a luminescence laboratory in Germany at the University of Cologne before obtaining a personal fellowship and moving to the University of Bern um, before finally getting my position back here in Lausanne in 2018. Um, 2018 was quite a busy year because I started a new job and I was also part of the team that launched uh, Geochronology, um, which is one of the newest EGU journals. So this was the journal is really the brainchild of um, Professor Andreas Lang from the University of Salzburg. And the motivation behind uh, launching the journal is that geochronology often is not recognized as a um, discrete discipline within the earth sciences, even though it's fundamental to most of the other research that we do as earth scientists. And that is something which is starting to change. So um, in the US, there's been a big movement towards having geochronology as a separate division uh, within some of the um, US-based meetings. At the moment, we don't have a separate division um, within EGU, and rather uh, the research that would be submitted to, to geochronology is spread, spread across various divisions. So climate, geomorphology, cryosphere, um, chemistry, mineralogy, petrology and volcanology. So we have a really diverse uh, group of scientists that, that do submit to the journal. Um, one of the our kind of um, hopes or objectives with geochronology is that it will offer a platform for advances in geochronological methods. Um, in the different scientists working on specific areas in geochronology will be able to interact with other fields of geochronology so that we can ultimately improve the quality of dating and that's so that you can take, um, for example, statistical methods such as from appetite fish and track dating um, have been implied in luminescence dating, although admittedly a bit before geochronology was launched. Uh, so we're hoping that we can facilitate this kind of dialogue between um, different method methodological disciplines. Um, and so far, the submissions are doing really well. We have around, we handle around 40 papers each year, um, and that's been fairly stable since, since we launched. Now, something that's quite nice at the moment, um, because we're a very young journal, we don't currently have any um, publishing costs or publishing charges. Rather, it does cost, but the costs are met by EGU rather than uh, by the authors. And that's because at the moment, we haven't yet obtained our impact factor. Um, although we've pres like recently been accepted to be listed in Scopus, and that's the first step towards obtaining an impact factor, which will hopefully come in the next couple of years. We accept a range of different uh, types of articles, so from research articles, that's your classic kind of scientific article, um, review articles, but something that's um, maybe uh, more exciting or interesting is that we also accept short communications and technical notes. And the technical notes in particular are really important for geochronological research because it's those methodological developments that often aren't um, communicated well that can really make the difference between having okay ages or a precision of 15% and maybe a precision of 5%. 
Um, so to date, the majority of our submissions have been research articles, um, but we anticipate that we'll get more uh, short communications and technical notes, as well as research articles, of course, in the future. Um, we've only run one special issue to date, and that was on uranium lead dating of carbonate. But again, we will um, have more special issues in the future. Um, with regard to specific comments for ECS researchers, um, our top tips for article submission, if you're uncertain if the article falls within the remit of a, of a journal or geochronology specifically, then feel free to contact one of the editors before you submit your paper, just to get some feedback on whether or not um, it does fit within the journal scope. And our policy at Geochronology is absolutely that ECS uh, researchers should review articles. And this is something that was communicated um, actively within our most recent editorial meeting, um, so that all of our topical editors are um, aware that they should be approaching final year PhD students or experienced um, junior researchers to get them to, to start reviewing articles. And I think that's everything that I had to say. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I'd like to introduce our final speaker, who is a chief editor of the Earth System Science Data, or ESSD journal for short, Ge Peng. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My uh, name is Ge Peng, and I go with Peng. I'm a senior principal research scientist at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. Um, my career is sort of uh, separated in three different stages. I start uh, with developing, implementing, and evaluating numerical model systems, and then I migrate into working with the data, and I, I notice my passion seems to be uh, more on the data, so it's uh, to produce and use and evaluate Earth system data product. In the last uh, five, 10 years, I start to actually turn into uh, more data scientist to be more um, focused as a scientific data store. Um, what I do is trying to find a way to improve data access and data usability um, to make it easier for users to use data, understand data, and access data. So. Uh, part of the um, that interest lead me to um, become one of the four chief editors at Earth System Science Data, and I'm also a chair for um, WMO, which is World Meteorology Organization uh, expert team on information management. That's a quick recap on um, myself, and I'm going to uh, talk more about the Earth System Science Data. It's a data journal. Um, it's an international interdiscipline, and they started in 2009 uh, as part of the International Polar Year to bridge research and the data. And at that time, there are not a whole lot of places that scientists can publish their data as well as a paper about the data. Um, the journals tend to more, focus more on the scientific research. And the ESSD is a fully open and free um, journal. It's published by Copernic um, publishers. They have been committed and supporting um, ESSD since it's um, starting. So in early 2000, I think 2010, we, ha we had about like eight papers for that particular year. It has been increasing uh, steadily since then. Had the big jump in 2018 as a part of the effort in the global carbon budget. Um, the last, last year we had almost 200 paper published and this year, as end of the September, we already exceed uh, that number. Um, the ESD also partner with the data centers around the world, and we work with them to improve the uh, data access. And we uh, promoting no barrier data access. I mean, not just you know um, 
the developed countries, also the developing countries would be able to access the latest uh, data for their research. Um, touch on a little bit about the process, the initial validation of the paper is carried out by the uh, Copernic supporting team. And we have about 10 days to uh, call for uh, topic editors. So they actually get to pick the papers they would like to uh, oversee the review process. And then uh, there's the initial screening in terms of the data access and whether it's um, publicly available and uh, uh, can be freely accessed after the paper is accept, accept, uh, accepted for publications. And then six weeks uh, interactive review process, as Julian has mentioned, very similar to that process, and during which community can uh, post their comments along with the uh, peer reviewer, um, reviewers. Uh, the, the authors are also encouraged to post their um, responses. And the end of the six to eight weeks uh, interactive review process, the topic editors would uh, take a quick look, make an intermediate decision, see whether the paper should go ahead and uh, whether the paper should be rejected based on the review comments. Um, the, oh, I should mention at the first initial screening that also including whether the paper is out of scope. Um, for the ESSD, we focus on data and some um, the basic validation result to support the quality, to demonstrate the quality of the data set uh, is encouraged but not extensive analysis paper. So after the authors revise their paper, uh, potentially it could go to another round of review by the previous reviewers, or the uh, if it's very minor and authors ha have already addressed um, the edits and uh, suggestions, the um, topic editor can make decision to accept the paper either with another uh, minor revision uh, in, including technical revision or accept as it is. Um, so there are two stage for the papers uh, that assign DOI, the people can uh, cite them. One is the, we call it discover, discussion paper as a during the interactive review process. And another one is the final accepted paper. And the, um, the both are publicly available and citable. And uh, ESSD track um, the views, downloads, and citations of both versions. And the one can go to their uh, website to look at it. So the, um, let me see, mention the uh, impact factor. So the, as um, many of, um, People know the data papers do not get a lot of credit initially, um, but it has changed recently. In the last um, five years, uh, the decade or so, uh, ESD impact factor actually has been pretty steadily increased. And uh, um, this last year is 11.3 and is top three geosciences journals. Although um, that's a great accomplishment, but ESSD is really focused on sharing high quality data product around the world. Um, so that's uh, something about the journal as far as the, um, the papers. And I'm going to, I think Julian and Georgia has um, have uh, provided a lot of good comments, and I'm going to try to see from the scientist and the editor, uh, you know, perspective, and more from a, the people who are trying to publish. So for the your first uh, five papers, and uh, my suggestion is to 
thinking about as a more of an ongoing process rather than you know do everything then sit down to write your paper take notes along the way because some of the best contents of my paper coming from the the notes i took along the way and another part aspect is that when we starting we tend to want to be everything to be perfect and what my advice is actually um once you have enough material and if you have a good story to tell that's an indication that you are ready to put together um, a paper on one time a famous scientist told us a uh, graduate student and he said if the paper your research didn't publish it's like you have the research has never been done so the um, making a publishing thinking about how you want to put together a story to readers and to your other um, the people in, in your domain that will be beneficial to them to learn I think that's something to keep in mind as you go along preparing your first paper or first five papers. Uh, regarding to the criticisms, um, Julie says, take it very seriously. I agree with that because the most of the people who provide the reviews are um, expert in the field. On the other hand, I also want to mention that do not take that criticism against yourself. And I used to take it very hard because for me, it's like, I want everything perfect before I send it. And I get this review back. They want a major revision. It's like, what do you mean you want a major revision? And, you know, um, so now I actually welcome it because you think about it and you actually give somebody expert in the field and offer their expert opinion for free. And it's a great way to improve your quality of your paper. Um, as the last part about the getting involved in reviewing papers, yes, absolutely. Um, whether it's uh, um, postdoc or early uh, career scientist. And I think you can start it as um, letting the, the topic editors know you are interested in providing review and kind of starting from there. And um, I, I'm sure it's a similar situation with other uh, ad, uh, journals. ESD always, always looking for topic editors and the uh, number of papers submitted this year has doubled and we are in dire need for topic editors as well as the reviewers. Uh, one of the, uh, advantage in my opinion is you get to learn the latest um, the science and you get to learn the latest trend of the research um let me see yeah um i i have something about the select uh data repository at the journals but i think i'm going to stop here and um, probably we will discuss that in the later part of this uh, a meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, just to the audience, as a reminder, please post your questions that you have in the Q&A box. You can also do this anonymously if you wanted to, um, and also feel free to start any discussion in the chat. Um, we do have a few questions that came in um, a bit earlier as we advertised this session on Twitter. Um, and so one question, I'll start off by aiming this towards Georgina. Um, people are a bit nervous about the fact that it's an open access discussion, the reviews and everything are open access, especially if it's your first paper. How do you, what would, advice would you give to people? I think the experience that we've had so far is that the quality of the, the reviews is higher than you would get in most kind of classical journals where they're not on public display. So I think, um, yes, there's no guarantee that you won't have a critical evaluation of your work, but ultimately critical evaluations of our work make the research better. And, uh, and as um, Peng said, it's really important not to take those criticisms personally, to, to step back, digest it, maybe take a day off, drink some tea, eat some chocolate, whatever, and then come back to the reviews and really think 
um, about what, what people have said, because it is a real privilege actually to get critical scientific feedback um, on your research. But coming back to the, the open review issue, I, I think you should not be put off um, by that process. It's, uh, it will, I believe it will be the future um, way the, the publishing goes and, uh, and really we're kind of ahead of the game with EGU by having this open review process. Thank you very much. Um, and now to Julianne, as you're a topical editor and relatively new into this field, how did you become a topical editor? Did you approach the journal yourself and do you feel like you needed a certain level of experience in reviewing before you did that? So for me, like Susanna Boyter just sent me an email and asked, oh, do you want to be a topical editor for Solid Earth? And so I, I said, yes, sure, that sounds great. But I like I, I know Solid Earth is also looking for a topical editor. So I know recently we were looking for someone to do like to, to look at uh, handle like gravity papers. So I think like if you're interested in becoming a topical editor, I would just talk to one of the, or like if you know one of the executive editors, or even if you don't know them, I would just approach them and talk about it. Um, I like, I didn't think much about like if I needed a certain expertise, but I think what's nice about the, like the structure with the topical editors is that you really only need to be an expert in like your field of expertise. So I think like, even if you're a postdoc, like you probably know a lot about the, the field that, that you study. Um, and so I think the, the, well, the most important thing that I noticed was, um, I mean, you also have the reviewers and the reviewers are experts. And so even, even if I myself am not an expert in a specific paper and that happens that I handle papers where I just don't know much about the topic, as long as I can, like, as long as I can identify reviewers who are an expert on the topic, then I can just rely on their opinion. And so then even, even if I don't know much about a specific paper, I can still handle that as an editor. So I don't think it's required to know everything about all of the papers you, uh, all of the papers you would handle as an editor. And do you think that also stands for if you're asked to review a paper and you might not be an expert, if it's quite a interdisciplinary paper, would you feel comfortable if an ECS or somebody reviewing approached you and said, I can review, but I'm only an expert in half of the paper. So I think especially for interdisciplinary papers as an editor, I would make sure that I get a reviewer from each discipline that the paper like covers. And so if it's more than two, I would also get more than two reviewers. And so I think that's totally fine as long as you let the editor know you're only an expert on one specific topic. Okay, great. Um, and now a question to you, Peng. You mentioned the data uh, repository service and with ESSD papers, you want everything to be open access. So the, the code, the data, etc. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, uh, for now, actually, ESSD requires data to be um, freely available and publicly uh, accessible. And uh, we are towards um, promoting to have a uh, source code available as well. And uh, it can be in a GitHub uh, repository. So we work, tend to work with the uh, dom data centers and domain centers. However, we do have uh, repositories that people, uh, you know, encourage people to deposit their data in the repositories. And that they are a number of, uh, um, the repositories now would uh, accept the data and assign a DOI. And I can put the link that people can use to find a repository if you don't have a domain repository that you can utilize. Okay, great, thank you very much. And I think this is the case across the board with the EGU journals that they're, they're trying to be a bit more open access, not just in their reviews, but also suggesting um, that, that people can upload data and, and code. So do you think that this is, did ESSD kind of launch the way for the rest of the EGU journals? Uh, that's an interesting claim. Um, I, I will put it this way. I think ESSD has the uh, leading the data sharing um, from because we, we have from start to uh, to kind of uh, insist and promoting that data is available. Um, I think AGU journals, um, I think Georgia and probably can't say more about that and has been um, 
the promoting open access um, in, in the last five, 10 years, I think it, it's uh, really uh, gaining more and more momentum. And uh, at the, the GSD is also kind of leading the data publications uh, because at the beginning, you know, data is not sexy and uh, scientists tend to look down on the people who produce, although they use the data, uh, they tend to say that's not scientifically um, in terms of scientific rigor. But I think I have seen that change and I'm doing more data um, papers now. And I feel like they get cited because uh, a lot more because data get to use it, which is great because people who produce data get credit to, uh, not just the scientists who do research and based on the data and writing scientific papers. And I think that's a great thing. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, so we have a question from an early career scientist who says that sometimes they see publications that they believe might they might have been suitable for as a reviewer, but perhaps they're not within this reviewer circuit yet. How could they try to be involved more as a re as a reviewer? I think one of you mentioned perhaps approaching someone that you might know, but is there any other way that that people could could kind of try to join the reviewer circuit? Uh, Georgina, maybe you have something on this. Yeah, I meant I meant to look this up actually before we uh, started the webinar. There is a reviewer database um, for EGU journals. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how you enter the database, whether it's because you previously reviewed for EGU, um, but that's something I believe that exists. So if you're interested in being a reviewer and you haven't been approached, if you contact the executive editors um, of your particular field journal, uh, then they'll be able to check that for you. Sorry that I can't give you a conclusive answer. Maybe Julianne or Peng knows. No. <laughs> but yeah, you, I think you know. any any of those way would work. Um, we we have early career scientists writing emails, just contact us saying, you know, we're interested and how can I help? and we will put them on the list in the database. And uh, for ESSD and all the people who published with us are in the database. And they are the pools that we draw from when we, um, as a topic editor, uh, to enlist people to review paper, um, review the manuscript. So one other thing I would also mention, so of course there's like you can contact like people who are at the journal, but one other way is also you can like talk to your advisor about that because they probably get a lot more review requests than they can handle. And so if they know you want to review a paper, they also know what your expertise is. So they can then just tell the journal, oh, I can't do this, but my student or my postdoc, they would be really interested in doing that. And as an editor, I'm really happy if I know, oh, there's someone who really wants to review and who will like put a lot of time into writing a good review. So that would also be another way. Thank you. I think that actually leads quite nicely onto the next question that we have, which is um, how many and is it crucial that you suggest a reviewer for your paper when you submit your paper? Julianne, perhaps you can say. So I think it's really useful if you do that. Um, and well, I, I, I don't think there's a specific number. I mean, so, but what I can say is like, when I contact a rev like when I contact reviewers, at least fifty percent of them say no, and oftentimes more. So it happens that I contact like ten different people, and they all say no. So it can be useful to have a list of more than two people if you like suggest uh, reviewers. And what I usually do is I try to pick someone like one person from the list that the authors provide, and then one person that's not on the list who I know will be an expert on the topic. And so like, and I think especially if like, I'm not an expert in the topic that the paper is on, then it's really, really useful for me to have a list of reviewers that, uh, that I could contact. Okay, great. Um, I think this next question will probably go to Georgina, but, but also to Peng, because you've got both quite interdisciplinary um, journals, as, you, as you've mentioned. 
If someone is unsure whether their paper should fit this journal because it is quite a broad topic or go to one that is a bit more specific, do you have any advice for these people on which direction to take? Uh, I can comment first. Um, I, it's always a difficult um, question. <laughs> Where, where's the best place to, to publish your research? One way that you can um, try and evaluate the best location is have a look at the papers that you've cited in the article and see which journal the majority of those papers come from, because that might give you an indication of where, where your paper would be most at home. Um, yeah, I guess I guess that would be my my main advice and also to contact the editors of the journals and to see whether or not that would fit in the remit and to see which prior work has been published in each of those journals um, on on the topic, but perhaps Peng has something to add. Uh, that's pretty good. It covered, um, I think, almost everything I would like to say. OK, great. Um, and, and another question that we have now sort of targets the special issues. Um, if you see that there is a special issue that might be relevant for your work, do you think it is useful to um, submit to the special issue or is it better to submit to the, the journal in general? Is there a kind of a target audience for the special issue? Um, I can't remember which one of you mentioned special issue, but I think it might have been you, Georgina. It was me. Um, I think that really depends on the timing of the, of the special issue relative to when you're ready to submit your paper. So special issues often have uh, deadlines. Deadlines are a good thing um, in terms of getting articles finished, but you also don't want to rush and, uh, and submit something that's not ready. So if you're if we had a special issue in uranium lead dating of carbonate, if you're working on exactly that, then I think that would be a fantastic um, place for your research. If you're working on uranium lead dating of zircon, then although it's the same uranium lead dating, it's not, not the right uh, avenue for your article. So you do need to consider. Um, another thing to think about is sometimes special issues have page restrictions. Um, and then that would mean writing your research in a particular way, which may or may not be appropriate. If it's one paper that you've produced from all your PhD work, then it's probably a longer article and being restricted to six pages or something would not be in the best interests of your, uh, of your research. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, can I add something to that? Okay, um, so I, I think as Georgia said, if your um, the topic and the time of your paper fits in a special journal, um, I would encourage you to submit to the special journal. And there are a couple of reasons. One is, first one is the targeted audience. So you have two different way of promoting your paper and a journal, a general journal, a general, um, on the general side, the uh, journal would publicize the paper and a special issue, it will go also get promoted. Uh, the second factor is that the, you really have a designated topic editors for the special journal. And they also know the, um, expert in the domains. So it tend to, the review process tend to go smooth compared, smooth, more smoothly compared to sometimes in other ones, like Julian said, sometimes we go through like a 10, my, you know, I, I maximum ones may go, may go through 20, 30, um, you know, the, the nominations. So it, that from that perspective, um, I would encourage you. So ESSD actually do uh, do special issues and we collaborate with science journals. We would be like a two part, we call it science paper that was submitted to other journal that focused on the scientific result. And the, the, um, the ESSD would um, focus on the data uh, aspect for the data papers. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we do only have a couple of minutes left before we start to wrap up the discussion, but I'm going to try and squeeze in a few more questions in the meantime. Um, Julianne, I think you mentioned keywords, which were ideal for assigning the right sort of topical editors to the, to the paper. Are there any other tips that you can give in that kind of way to make it an easier process for editors when you're submitting your paper? 
so I can't think of uh, of anything right now. I mean, it's like it's easy for an editor if like the editor knows exactly like what the, what the paper is about and like what reviewers to ask. So I mean, we already covered like uh, providing a list of reviewers and like uh, providing a cover letter, so that it's then really clear to me, um, yeah, what the, what the paper is about and who I have to send it out to review and I mean otherwise like the other thing in terms of making the review process smooth is like before you submit your paper check that like it's a hundred percent in the state that you want it to be in so right the, the the better your paper is before you submit it the like the the fewer comments reviewers will have so like sometimes I see papers where I notice oh someone was like in a hurry to submit the paper um and like something is like even it's like if figure captions don't fit to the right figure or something like that. So I would just say, like, just make sure that your paper is in the quality you want to see it published before you submit. Um, and I, I think otherwise, like, otherwise the, the process is really straightforward. So like as an editor, I find it really hardest, like the, the first stage of like, if I have to ask a lot of reviewers and then they all decline. So like, I think that's, that's a good point to like have a list of reviewers that I can send the paper out to. Um, and again, just going back to touching on the sort of open access sort of side of things. Um, sometimes I think people are unsure of where they can use the figures and the information um, going forward with it being an open access paper. So are people allowed to sort of redistribute these figures if they have a blog or a website or perhaps they want to you know, show some results at a conference? Or, or do they still have to go through some process to ensure that the right person is, is cited? I should probably say who should answer this question. Um, Peng, perhaps you can take this one. Yeah, um, all the journals um, have the usage license. And I think people who uh, utilize figures or diagram, they really should uh, properly cite where it's come from and give the quality to uh, whoever um, produced that particular one. And they also need to be, uh, careful about if the uh, usage of the diagram, you know, the figures indicate their um, preparatory and they really needs to get, obtain the copyright in order to use that. Um, but I think currently most scientific papers are under the um, CC, the, uh, the common uh, license that you can, you, you know, you can use and freely distribute it if it's for non-commercial purpose or some even just, you know, to uh, communicate, it should be no problem, but definitely pay attention if it's not, uh, li depends on the type of the license. Yeah, so I would also say like that that goes for like every journal, like if you want to reuse any figure that has been published anywhere, you need to go into like where it says what is the license of this journal and then you need to read through the license and like read what it allows you to do with it. And like almost all of the journals as far as I know allow you to use figures if you give a presentation at a conference. Um, at least if it's like your own work that like you have published and then you want to reuse your own figures for a talk, like that's usually no problem at all. But like, for example, just posting something on a blog, that's not always possible, like depending on what license the journal has. And if it's an open access journal, then this is much easier than for journals with restricted access. But I would always make sure to check what exactly the license is. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. So I think the final question to sort of wrap up the discussion would be, if you had one sort of top tip to give to um, scientists and early career scientists on how to have a really successful experience with publishing within a EU journal, what would you say? Um, let's start with Georgina. Oh, uh, top tip, I guess just do it. Just do it, don't, don't hesitate, um, go, go for the process, enjoy the open review, profit, um, from from the feedback and the fact that you can have that discussion in public and maybe try and discuss with your peers and encourage them to join the discussion on your work um because yeah i mean it's a great opportunity to get that feedback uh peng yes um i agree just do it and the practice make it better and uh, also try to think about um 
rather than what you have done, what you did, try to think about what the message, what a story you want a reader to learn from your work. And Julianne, finally. Yeah, so I just want to add like the, the open review process is like, I found it less scary than I thought initially. So I also was afraid of like, oh, like this means like all of the people in the community then now suddenly can like comment on your paper and you have to reply to all of those comments. But like in the in the end, when I like, so with, uh, as a co-author submitted a journal to one of, uh, a paper to one of the EGU journals, I was like, like in the end, this was much less scary than I thought. And it was like more similar to uh, like uh, other journals review processes than I had thought. Um, and so I like for me, it was a really good experience. So I would also say, yeah, just just go ahead and submit to one of the EGU journals. Thank you so much to our three speakers today. We really appreciate your time and your top tips for a successful publication process. Um, for anybody who would want to continue the discussion a bit more in a few weeks time, this webinar will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, the EGU YouTube channel. So take a look on there. Um, and also if you want to pass on the link to any of your colleagues who might be interested. But for now, thank you very much for joining and goodbye. <laughs>